Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson. The best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. Welcome to Storytime with Chris James. And once again, I will try to pick up right where I left off. The front door swung open. Pam was used to the door opening and closing, but then a figure appeared. It was huge, nearly seven feet tall and wide like a football player with all of his things on. Pam felt an urge to run as she was about to make a sprint for the kitchen door when the figure spoke. You ordered the pizza? As the figure moved in through the opening, Pam saw it was mostly clothing. The guy was wearing a winter parka over short pants and tennies. It's a bit chilly out there. He flipped the hood back to reveal dark skin and coarse black hair sticking out in all directions. It was the same pizza guy from the other night. Pam was relieved as she wasn't about to be killed by a Sasquatch or something. How much do I owe? A fifteen twenty-five. You ordered a large Supreme with extra cheese. Pam pulled a twenty and a five from her pocket. The delivery guy placed the box on the desk and then he looked at the book. Oh wow, do you read Rongo Rongo too? Um no, I was just looking at the pictures. No one in this town speaks Rongo Rongo. Yeah, tell that to my granny. He flipped a few pages. Man, this is kind of depressing. Your grandmother speaks Rongo Rongo? Yep, she grew up in Rapa Nui. Uh, she taught me some, but man, it's not easy. I had a hard enough time learning Greek. Is your grandmother here in town? Yeah, she lives with us over on the east side of town. Ooh, the east side of town. Someone had some cash. Uh, then, why is this guy delivering pizzas? Um, why are you delivering pizzas? Pam felt as if she were invading his privacy. Oh man, it's my folks. They got involved in something called financial peace or something like that. Financial peace? You mean that Dave thing? Uh, Pam was surprised again. My folks got into that last year. It's why I'm working here. The thought of her parents made her uneasy. They were stuck in the middle of town with no way out but her. and She felt as if they were doomed. That's kind of wild, he held out his hand. My name is Tom. It's, it was like they were related by a lack of debt. Uh, Tom, that doesn't sound very exotic. Pam figured he should have a name with lots of vowels and not enough consonants. My folks call me Tomasi. It, it's an island version of Thomas. Pam got back to thinking about her folks who were on their way to becoming ice sculptures. Can you tell me what this book says? I can try. He surprisingly looked at his watch, surreptitiously looked at his watch. I only have a minute or so. Pam reached into the desk drawer and pulled a few large bills from the petty cash fund. I'll make it worth your while. Uh, Tom focused on the front page of the book. Let's see, whoever wrote this thing was only using Rongo Rongo because it's an obscure language. Pam was impressed. You can tell that from just looking at the writing? Oh no, it says that on the front page. I'm using this and I'm writing this in Rongo Rongo because no one can translate this obscure language. 
Tom flipped to the next page. I think it says something about a Dybbuk box. No, it's kind of like a Dybbuk box. He scratched his head. You should get my granny to look at this book. As she speaks Rongo Rongo like a native. Tom considered his last statement and felt just a little foolish. A Dybbuk is a restless, mostly hateful spirit believed to be able to haunt and even possess the living. One was found inside a haunted wine cabinet that was sold on eBay. Oh, when can I get her to look at it? Pam was beginning to think just maybe they could save the day. I don't know. She's getting kind of up there in years. Uh, Pam felt herself sinking again. I know. Bring her by for a free healing. You guys do healings here? Uh, Tom looked as if he might say yes. And a card reading and a free cup of coffee. Uh, Pam was pulling out all the stops. Well, all right then. Uh, how about, say, in the afternoon? I'll be out of class by then. He pulled the hood back up over his head, turned, and headed out into the snow. After eating her dinner, Pam got cleaned up and headed for bed. The goat was there, snoring on his side of the bed. His side? Well, he did like it closer to the door. Pam considered this a good plan. If there actually were a monster intent on eating sleepers in this particular bed, it would get the goat first, giving Pam to run around the room and completely go insane waiting for him to kill her. Now, Pam got under the covers and did her best to sleep. She tried to sleep but found her mind kept showing images of her folks slowly turning to popsicles. Mom and popsicles. Now, she tried to ignore the images. Look, I'm trying to sleep here. Stop with the morbid scenes. Okay, how about an accidental house fire? Now, Pam thought what might happen when her dad tried to build a fire in the living room only to set fire to the entire house. After a few hours of entertaining herself by watching her parents' departure from this life, Pam turned the light on and tried to read. Aliens attack Walmart. It sure beat the heck out of dead parents. Chapter 12. The Plot Sickens Eddie entered the bag building by way of the back door. He found parking his motorcycle out back was fine as long as he didn't park too close to the building. He pulled his key out to unlock the library door, but realized the door was partially open. I thought I locked this last night. He pushed the door inwards. A Pam sat at the bar, a fresh cup of java in front of her. How long you been up? he asked, getting a cup for himself. All night. Kept thinking about my folks. Now Pam's eyes were as red as the stop sign. Eddie took a drink and made a face. You need to learn how to relax and learn how to make a good cup of coffee. He poured the nasty stuff down the drain and started on making a fresh pot. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. Uh, Pam filled Eddie in on Tom and his grandmother. Pam wandered out to reception to see about something to distract her from worrying about her folks. Uh, Susie was already at her desk. Morning. I came in early to get started on the paychecks. A Susie looked as if she'd drank 20 cups of espresso already. She had an abacus set up next to the notebook with everyone's hours listed. Pam thought about it a second, but it's only Wednesday. The checks aren't due till Friday. She had spent many a long day trying to get the numbers to make sense. By getting everything done early, it gives me time to focus on less pressing things. Miss Susie didn't stop filing out, filling out papers and fiddling with the abacus as she talked to Pam. She was even filling out the pay records so at the end of the year they wouldn't have to make up their tax records again. Pam took her cell phone and walked out the front door. And she crossed the other side of the street to an old burned-out mansion that used to be there but was destroyed while her grandfather had been battling a demon many years ago. The cold wind was worse than yesterday. Pam looked up at the sky and thought it looked like snow even this far from Central Neighborhood. Her neighborhood. Dialing her mother's cell phone, Pam waited for an answer. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is unavailable at this time. Please try back later. 
Pam tried a few more times, just in case the problem had corrected itself. Her mother was not available. Uh, Not to leave anyone out, Pam tried her dad's number as well, and then in desperation she called the landline. It rang a few times, and and then she heard her dad's voice. Hello, what's up? He sounded tired. "Uh, Dad, is everything all right? I tried calling your cell phone, but I couldn't get through. Oh, it's the cell tower. It fell over last night. He sounded tired. Uh, Pam wondered how he would know the tower that was a mile from the house had fallen over. I was up on the roof shoveling snow so the roof wouldn't collapse. He knew his daughter well enough to guess she was about to ask. It snowed all night, so I was up there a lot. Is everything all right? Pam didn't want to know. Her dad was not one to mince words. We're kind of packed in here. There are people sleeping on the living room floor. We're down to eating just canned goods. We finished off the refrigerator last night. If nothing else, I'll get my rifle out and see about shooting some of the grill, something to grill. You're going to go hunting in the middle of town? Pam knew her dad wasn't much on joking. Uh, I saw a pack of wolves running through the streets last night while I was shoveling. Wolves? Yeah, they're kind of chewy, but they're full of protein. Uh, Dad, whatever you do, don't start a bonfire in the living room. Uh, Don't worry about us. Just take care of yourself. Her dad was putting on extra macho. Uh, Can I speak to Mom? Pam felt the need to talk to her mother. Uh, She's asleep right now. She was up all night with a hard delivery. Delivery? Who's making deliveries in this weather? Pam was confused. Oh, not that kind of delivery. A woman from down the block was pregnant, and now we have a newborn in the hall closet. Uh, Pam said all the things you want to say to the family you're afraid you might never see again. As Pam was about to cross the street back to the bag office, she noticed there was a bunch of cops lined up along the porch. They were all dressed in black, and they had serious-looking weapons. The Civil War soldiers were all standing around them, uh, playing as if the SWAT team was there for the soldiers. One of the soldiers was standing at the end of the stack as if he were a member of the entry team. His musket was pointed in the air like the SWAT team were doing. Uh, Pam was so absorbed by the spectacle, she didn't bother to ask herself what was going on. With extreme speed and violence of action, that's one of those cool SWAT terms, the member with the battering ram swung it at the massive door. Too bad he didn't know the door wasn't locked. It wasn't even latched. The only thing holding the door shut had been the slight difference in air pressure from one side of the door to the other. The battering ram touched the door at a very fast and vicious manner, and the door did its best to get out of the way without obtaining any damage to its slightly old paint job. The officer holding the battering ram found out about Newton's first law of motion. When viewed in an inertial reference frame, an object either remains at rest or continues to move at a constant velocity unless acted upon by an external force. The battering ram remained in its constant velocity while the door, acting in a very sane manner, had gotten out of the way. This led to this same officer becoming way too familiar with Newton's third law. When one body exerts a force on a second body, the second body simultaneously exerts an equal force on the magnitude and opposite in direction on the first body. Boy, that's a mouthful. He was pulled off his feet and followed the battering ram in and then through and then around the front door. The rest of the entry team, actually it was the entry team, the battering ram officer was supposed to remain on the porch and act as a backup for the real entry team. Anyway, the entry team saw their buddy fly through the air and into the unknown territory and they entered as fast as they could. The third officer in the team began yelling, Police, police, no one move. Pam stood on the far side of the street and watched in amazement as the SWAT team literally vanished in the wink of an eye. She was not known for her bravery or her rapid logical decision making, but she was known for doing unsafe, insane things at the exact wrong moment. She ran across the street and tried to enter the office. 
A female officer caught Pam as she went by, and uh, Pam soon found herself face down in the parking lot. Uh, something cold and hard was holding her wrists. Um, sorry, I got carried away. Pam made a good decision to remain on the ground. From her new position closer to the door, Pam could hear, if not see, what was going on. Hands in the air, don't move. But then there was some scuffling sound coming from the office. Stop resisting! Pam knew from her short but interesting time with the bogus anomalous group, this was not a good thing to hear. She rolled to one side so she could see what was happening to her job. The sound of things being tipped over, very heavy things, and the sound of things breaking, very expensive things, came from the open door. Several men could be heard struggling with some unstoppable fiend. And then it got quiet. The kind of quiet just before things go to pieces in a big, bad hurry. Pam was afraid to watch. She closed one eye, but then her curiosity got the better of her, and so she opened to just one eye, so anything bad would either enter her brain at half speed or not at all. The two officers appeared in the open door. Each was holding what looked like a leg. Then the body of the teen woman could be seen struggling just beyond their mighty visages. Two more officers appeared in the doorway holding a set of arms. The SWAT team was dragging Bonnie Fulbright, a.k.a. Susie Quirtz, a.k.a. Mrs. Hatchet, a.k.a. Dorothy, the only self-proclaimed sane person in the body, out to a waiting squad car. The wires from three tasers were hanging from Bonnie's body. Uh, Bonnie wasn't too interested in going along quietly. She absolutely refused to remain silent as well. I'll kill you, you creeps. Turn me loose and I'll beat you till your grandmother hurts. She used a few words that Pam had been told to never use. It took six officers to get Bonnie into the squad car. Uh, Bonnie was holding one officer around the neck using her legs to throttle him. She also had a mouthful of someone's uniform. One officer had his taser out ready to adjust Bonnie's attitude as if the last three had only tweaked it just a bit. Pam didn't want to see her best employee get hurt. She yelled, uh, Dorothy, can you hear me? I need to talk to you. See, I told you she was crazy. And Dorothy became totally calm. The officer with the legs around the neck problem was relieved to be able to breathe again. Pam worked her legs up under her body while thinking about Hilda always having to get up from the ground. Uh, Dorothy, did Susie finish the payroll? Oh yes, the checks are all in their mail drawers. Now, Dorothy calmly stepped into the back of the squad car as if nothing particularly out of the sort were going on. The officers that had been trying to ass assist her in entering the vehicle without losing too many parts of their uniform all stopped in their efforts, unsure of what had just happened. Pam wanted to help out, help without going to jail herself. Is there anyone I should call, like her mother? Uh, now we're all here, uh, just hang on to her check. Uh, she should be back in a year or two. And with that, the door was slammed and the squad car hauling Susie, Bonnie, Miss Hatchet, and Dorothy drove away. The lady cop got the handcuffs off Pam's wrists. I didn't want to have to shoot you, so I dropped you to the ground instead. I didn't want you to shoot me either. Now, Pam was glad to not be sitting in the back of a squad car on her way to downtown. Um, can I ask what she did to earn so much attention? Uh, she called City Hall and said she was going to kill the dog catcher. The dog catcher just happens to be the mayor's cousin. Uh, tell Mr. Armstrong he owes we one. And with that, the bogus anomalous group's office became devoid of police officers. As the last car drove away, Pam noticed a couple of Civil War soldiers sitting on the roof using the light bar as a handle. Pam stuck her head in through the front door. It looked as if a tornado had touched down in the reception office. The desk was upside down. The office chair was through the bathroom door. Not through it like the door was open first, uh, through it as in stuck parkway through the wood. Uh, books and papers were everywhere. 
the bag gang got things back to where they were mostly belonged as soon as she set the office chair back behind the now righted desk prince wapo came strolling over plopped down on the seat and went to sleep looking at the status board nearly half the staff were still out must be the weather pam hoped to find a solution to this bizarreness when tom's grandmother came by the comes by this afternoon things can't get any she clamped both hands over her mouth. A few people came in looking for their favorite paranormal operator. Looking out the front door, Pam could see the snow had finally come to the front yard of the bag building. I wonder if the mayor still says people have to be crazy to say it's snowing. Oh, he's no longer in town. What? He took off. A fled town for uh, just like a true leader. Great, Pam went to see about something to warm up her spirits. The coffee shop was mostly empty. Hilda stood at the bar, holding on so she could stay off the floor, a cup of something frothy in front of her. She had on a coat that reached all the way to the floor, and then some. Of course, Wanda was in her place, a fresh cup of coffee all ready for her in case she needed a shot of caffeine. Eddie slid Pam's favorite beverage across the counter. I need to let you know I'll be leaving early today. I have to take the family out of town. We're heading to my folks' place. Uh, I have to get them away from this cold. He looked as if it hurt to say it. I'll try to be back tomorrow afternoon. And Pam answered, uh, You work plenty hard. Uh, why not take a few days off? You need some family time. And Pam thought about her less than tasty coffee. Uh, could you brew up a batch before you go? I have someone coming in to look at the book. Sure thing. You want me to make a bunch of sandwiches as well? No, that's not necessary. I still have some pizza from last night. Now, Pam didn't think she could handle many more interesting sandwiches. With little to do, the time drug by. Now, Pam tried to decide who would be the happy recipient of the dining room now that it was unusable, unused. Uh, Susie had not only removed the hundreds of boxes filled with papers, she had managed to clean the room as well. It looked ready to move in, as long as you were looking for a formal dining room style office. The furniture was all left over from a time when dinner was served in China by people dressed in uniforms that showed how much money the diners were willing to spend on people that served food to them. <laughs> the chairs were all carved wood. Uh, there were ten of them. The table was covered with lace tablecloth that had been white about 75 years ago. On the sideboard sat a collection of glass thingies that rich people used to make less rich people feel less rich. A Pam was about to pull one of the chairs out and sit so she could think harder on the subject at hand when the ringing phone called for her attention. Hello, thanks for calling the bag company. How can we help you? Pam felt less perky than a campfire after being smothered with water. Uh, this is Mr. Mahoogi. What are you doing about the weather? He sounded upset about something. Uh, Mr. Mahoogi, uh, we're working as hard as we can on the problem. It's not as if we're needing a ghost removal from your cellar. The weather's a bit farther along the labor chart. And Pam checked her watch for the umpteenth time. It was exactly five minutes from the last time she'd checked. We have lots of leads to examine, but it takes time to run through all the possibilities. I'm paying you for results. My business is at stake here. He had best hurry if you want to see any money. Click. Now, Pam was about to let rip with a good, really good comeback when the front door swung open. Tom came in along with a woman dressed in traditional Rapa Nui dress. Traditional Rapa Nui dress is very similar to traditional Tahitian dress. Traditional Tahitian dress looks a lot like traditional Hawaiian dress. The outfit might have looked much better on a woman half, no, a quarter her age. Miss Bogus, this is my granny, Casanita. He was practically dragging the old lady through the door. Uh, tell her what Casanita means. Go on, tell her. 
The old lady sounded as if she'd smoked a few thousand cigarettes in her long lifetime. Tom looked as if this was a common thing between him and his grandmother. Uh, Cassinita means rub two sticks together to make fire. It means I'm hot, she winked at Pam. Okay, Pam hoped this lady was a lot sharper than she appeared. Does your grandmother always dress like this? I'm right here in front of you, sweetie. You can direct all your questions at me. The old lady plopped down in the visitor's chair, pulled her halter top back up, and crossed her arms. Good Lord, it's cold in here. Tom looked as if he put up with this all the time. Uh, Granny, I told you it was cold out. Tom had on his winter parka, along with some short pants. A different color, same style as last time. Uh, don't give me that. It's mid-July. It should be 90 degrees out. Now, Pam wanted to get this cantankerous old lady finished and back to her grass hut. Your grandson told me you could translate a book written in Rongo Rongo. Uh, could you do that for us? He told me something about a free card reading, a healing, and a cup of coffee. She turned her head away as if to show how upset she was and not getting the goodies yet. If you could get started on the book, I'll see about your coffee. Now, Pam slid the book over to Casanita so she could see it. Pam poured three cups of coffee and piled the creamer and sugar onto a tray and lugged the whole mess out to Susie's desk. Have to stop calling it Susie's desk now that she's in custody. And Casanita was flipping through the pages, hardly looking at them. Uh, just a quick glance and then on to the next one. So, can you tell us what it says? Pam hoped her translation ability was as good as Tom seemed to think it was. It says the Arctic spirit has been locked inside a box to stay for all of eternity, or till some numbskull opened the box and let him out. The box was carved by a great shaman who took 27 years to design and make it. He then tricked the spirit to enter the box. Does it say how we can trick the spirit back into the box? You better give me something to write with. The details are kind of involved. Uh, Cassanita got busy with a pencil and a notebook. Tom was busy trying to examine the molding around the door. Okay, that should do the trick, if you're lucky. And the spirit hasn't grown too powerful, and, and everything works out. And Cassanita downed her espresso in one gulp. Whoever wrote this book wasn't from Rapa Nui. He only used the language to confuse people. Uh, probably some European lunk. I think it's that guy in Austria, to tell the truth, she eyed Pam. And now, about that card reading. Pam glanced over at the status board, and already knowing Madame Dingus hadn't made it in today. Mmm, how about a healing? Uh, we can get your card reading later. A healing is the last thing I need. I was promised a card reading. And Casanita looked unhappy. Granny, you should take the healing. Remember your knees are hurting this morning. Tom was playing the hero. That's just the weather. When it gets cold and damp, my joints act up. And Casanita was now being stubborn. Well, as long as we're here, I'll take the healing then. Now, Pam was about to send Rapanuian, the Rapanuian, the, she was about to send Casanita upstairs, but then thought better of it. Come with me, and we'll get you healed and ready for... Uh, come with me, Pam led the old lady to Cassandra's office. Wait right here, and I'll be right back. Uh, Pam eased out the door, closed it, and then took off running. She ran up the stairs to the second floor and then knocked on room 2C. Hilda, I need you downstairs right now. Pam was out of breath. Are the cops back? Hilda was dressed in a floor-length sequined evening gown. Her platform shoes were hot pink. Her fashion sense was non-existent. No, no, I have a client in Cassandra's office, but I need you to do the honors. Her breath was catching back up with her lungs. But that's Cassandra's room. It would be like violating her space. Hilda was reading a book on Reiki healing. Now, I don't have time to discuss this. It's getting colder by the minute. Pam herded Hilda out the door and over to the steps. Give me your hand. Oh, I'm okay. I know how to walk, Hilda was saying as she took the first step. Pam got Hilda back on her feet. 
That was kind of exciting. Hilda had to stop and twist her dress back around frontwards. I believe this belongs to you, Pam handed over one hot pink shoe. I don't get it. I never have this problem walking at home. Hilda plopped down on the last step to strap her shoe back on. Now, Pam wanted to say it might be the shoes, but you just don't talk bad about someone's footwear. Pam got Hilda into Cassandra's room and then took a load off her feet. Sitting at Susie's, well, no, at, at her, well, at the receptionist's desk, Pam put her feet up on the corner and leaned back. Prince Wapo looked down at her from the filing cabinet. I think I need a vacation. Closing her eyes, Pam tried to relax and think. A gust of cold wind blasted in through the front door, and this made thinking or relaxing near impossible. I should get Grandy to look at that heater. Maybe it just needs a pilot light lit. Pam didn't even know if the big old mansion had a heater. Grandy hadn't come in this morning since none of the staff that usually gave him a lift had come in. The sound of people coming down the hall got Pam's attention. She dropped her feet off the desk and sat up just as Tom and Casanita came walking to the front door. Now, Casanita was actually swinging her hips as she walked as if doing some tribal dance. Well, that was great. I feel like dancing all the way home. Not in the truck. You'll have to wait till we get home. Tom thanked Pam and then escorted his grandmother out to his pickup. Hilda came clomping around the corner. Is your sister still available for work? Pam dreaded the thought of two Hildas running around falling all over everything and still somebody was needed to answer the phone. I'll ask her when I get home, as Susie stood there swaying back and forth. I thought you said she lived in your mother's basement. Well, she does. I live with her. Pam looked out the front door at the snow as it piled up on the lawn. You should get going. If this keeps up, you'll be stuck here with me all night. No clients waiting for relief? You and I are the only ones here. Eddie had already taken off, and he wouldn't be back for some time. Hilda pulled the long coat from the closet and got busy pulling it on and buttoning it up. She clomped out the door and fought the wind over to her car. It was more like she used the wind. A strong gust came up and blew her along the sidewalk, stopping as she slammed into the driver's door. I'm good. I'm not ready to deal with two of them. Pam closed the door and wedged a chair up under the knob. Uh, putting the notebook over to see what all would be involved in tracking the Arctic spirit back into its prison, Pam became aware of a small detail that she had overlooked. How am I supposed to find the box? The card had said it was impossible to get to. The sound of creaking filled the air. The wind was really pounding outside. Pam felt completely lost as to what to do next. She sat there flipping through the pages as if by some miracle she'd find the answer in the book. Maybe there's a map showing the location of this mystery case. And she kept going in hopes of being correct. When she finally arrived at the last page, which showed a city completely engulfed in ice and snow, the scene made Pam shudder, that in the wind blowing in through all the cracks in the building. Turning the page so the picture of death and destruction would disappear from her vision, if not her mind, Pam saw a receipt stuck to the inside of the back cover. The receipt was from Sam Antique Store in Austin. It had a bunch of numbers written all over it. And then it said, One book of disaster scenes, one cursed box, paid in full to Mrs. Hatchet. Charges, $125. Mrs. Hatchett bought the book and the cursed box in Austin? That would mean she knew where to find the box the Arctic Spirit came from. Pam hoped she had come to a logical conclusion. A past experience had proven her wrong on more than one occasion. She grabbed the phone, calling the local police station. She was told to speak to someone in English. Press 1 now. Then, 
If you're calling on a rotary phone, please hang up and try back when you've come to grips with modern technology. Pam slammed the handset down. This just isn't right. Don't they know I'm trying to save the, the city, if, if not the world? Pam pulled on her coat, hat, gloves, and then she unwedged the chair holding the front door shut and the cold mostly out. Stepping out onto the front porch, she saw the Civil War ghosts had started a ghost fire and were standing around trying to stay warm. Hey, you guys can go inside and get in out of the weather. As the last words were leaving her lips, the ghost stampeded in the semi-warm building. Just don't wedge the front door shut, Pam kicked snow out of her way as she stomped down the sidewalk and across the street. She clomb up onto the porch of the burned-out building to get something between her and the worst of the wind. Pulling her cell phone out, she tried the police station once more. To speak to someone in English, press 1 now, Pam pressed 1. To speak to somebody about a ticket, press 1 now. How about speaking to a human, Pam yelled into the cell phone. To, to speak to someone about the hiring process, press 7 now. To speak to someone about a robbery, press 8 now. Pam seethed. It did nothing to warm her. To speak to somebody about an arrest, press 9 now. Pam quickly pressed the 9 button. She heard it begin to ring at the other end. After six or seven rings, a computer voice came on the line. All of our officers are assisting other calls. Please stay on the line and someone will be with you shortly. Uh, this was followed by 21st century schizoid man playing in the background. It sounded as if it were being played by a string quartet. It sounded as bad as it could possibly get. After Pam, arm had gone to sleep and the, the cold had found its way into her clothing, the sound of ringing came on the line, followed by, Good evening, thank you for calling. How might I assist you tonight? He sounded just a whole lot bored. Hello, this is Pam Bogus. I'm calling about an arrest y'all made earlier today. Are you calling about that crazy woman we hauled out of your place this afternoon? Now he sounded worried. Yes, sir, I really need to speak to her. You'll have to contact the sheriff's department. They handle all custodies once we bring them in. After we log them in, we take them to the county jail, and the sheriff runs that place. After a pause, he said, Why do you want to talk to her? She's the craziest person I've ever seen, and I've been working here for 28 years. You know how the weather has gone weird around central part of town? She might know how to stop it. That doesn't surprise me one bit. It would take somebody as crazy as her to know what's going on. And then he got back to what he was doing. Hold on, I'll transfer you, followed by some beeping. Thank you for calling the sheriff's department. To speak to somebody in English, press 1 now. Pam pressed the 1. When she was just about run out of numbers on her phone, a voice came on that actually sounded as if it had a pulse. Uh, good evening. How can I help you tonight? Uh, sir, I need to speak to either Mrs. Hatchett or Susie Quartz or Bonnie Fulbright or Dorothy. No last name given. Oh, you want to talk to that crazy woman. Now, she's no longer with us, the board deputy said. Pam felt a sense of hope followed by disaster. Did they already let her go or had she tried something and they had blasted her to pieces? You need to contact MHMR. You know their number? Is that the state nut house? You know it. Just call them. Good luck with that one. Click. Having worked at the bag for a month, Pam had found it advisable to have the MHMR number saved on her phone. With great dread, Pam dialed the number. To speak to someone in English... Now, Pam wanted to scream, but it was just too cold to even try. Once more, she was running out of numbers on the phone. She found a human voice speaking. And what can we do for you tonight? It sounded just a bit dreamy. Pam explained her predicament. I'm sorry visiting hours are over. Uh, perhaps you'd like to try back tomorrow. 
There might not be a tomorrow. Are you aware of this freakish weather? The central part of town is under six feet of snow and my folks are stuck in our house. Pam was getting close to hysterics. Are you sure you need to speak with one of our patients? Uh, maybe you'd like to speak with one of our staff. You sound just a bit disturbed. Pam was at the end of her rope. Why can't I just... There was a sound of an argument on the line. Then a different voice came on. Uh, sorry about that. He usually stays away from the phone. How might I help you? I need to speak to either Mrs. Hatchett, Bonnie Fulbright, Susie Quartz, or Dorothy with no last name. Pam went through the entire speech again. It's past visiting hours. And then Pam thought she could hear the sound of mental gears crashing as they tried to form a thought. Does this have anything to do with my house being buried under eight feet of snow? It has everything to do with it. Pam was about to freeze to death if she didn't get to the end of this call soon. I really shouldn't, but wait just a second. I'll see if she'll come to the phone. There was a click as the handset was set down on the counter. Uh, Pam yelled, ask for Dorothy. She's the only sane one in there. Pam's phone chose that exact moment to go beep, letting her know her battery was about shot. Oh no, not now. This can't be happening. Pam started jumping from one foot to the other, either to stay warm or because she needed the bathroom. A voice came on the line. Yes, followed by... You really shouldn't be calling them. They're all crazy, you know. It was Dorothy. Uh, Dorothy, listen, I have to know what Mrs. Hatchett did with that case she bought in Austin. Oh, I don't know. She snuck out of the house without telling me. And Dorothy was whispering so the others wouldn't know she was on the phone. Pam was losing her battle with her sensibilities. Who did she tell? Did she tell the others? Let me ask. There was a mumbled discussion, followed by an argument. What sounded like somebody being slapped came through the line. How dare you? You you gave my job away. The sound of sobbing came through the line. Susie? Is this Susie? Of course it was. None of the others had been employed by the bag company. I didn't give your job away. I hired somebody to answer the phone. You're still our receptionist. You're just, you're on furlough. The sound of bodily fluids being vacuumed back up into the sinuses filled the speaker. You're not just saying that, are you? Susie, can you tell me where Mrs. Hatchett sold that big case she picked up in Austin? Can you? Pam tried to sound as pleasant and employerly as she could. The voice changed. It was Bonnie. And she can't tell you the time of day. I know where she sold the leather case with the engravings on the lid. Pam was worried more than usual. Can you or will you tell me where she sold it? Pam ladled on the sweetness. What's in it for me? Just like any teenager. Uh, what do you want? Pam crossed her fingers, hoping the teen wouldn't demand anything Pam would find it difficult to deliver. I want a copy of every book Terry Pratchett ever wrote. There was a slight pause. In hardcover. Pam was relieved. How many books could the man have written? Uh, sure, no problem. Uh, so tell me, where did Miss Hatchett sell the case? You promise, if you're lying, I'll send Annabelle to see you. Annabelle? Who in the world? Must be another personality. I promise I will get all of Terry Pratchett's books in hardcover. You want them signed, too? Well, of course, is there any other way to collect books? Pam's phone went beep, beep, letting her know it was just about to die. So where did she sell the box? Pam wanted to reach through the speaker and throttle the teen woman. She sold it to the bandolarium, and the phone went dead. The bandolarium? What's a bandolarium? Pam asked the now shut down phone. She held the phone out at arm's length. What the heck is a bandolarium? She yelled at the now dead phone. Pam stomped her way back to the office. The snow was now two feet deep in the street. She could barely feel her feet by the time she got onto the porch and in through the door. She went straight to the bookshelf and grabbed a phone book. 
Flipping through, she looked for antique shops, and there it was. The Bandelirium Antiques and Oddities, and it was only four blocks from her house. Pam ran to the back door, intent on getting the company car and driving to the store. The snowfall was not allowing any kind of driving. Not tonight, maybe not ever. Pam fell to her knees. Tears managed to fall halfway down her cheeks before freezing. I'm never going to make it in this. Lieutenant Brambleberry saw the look on her face. A dear child, what has brought on such grief to your fair continence? Pam had to decipher this flowery speech. It's snowing and I can't drive over to save my folks' lives and now we're all going to die and join you in the afterlife. Why, if you can't drive, why not take a sleigh? The officer looked very heroic as he waded out into the snow and vanished into the storage shed. Way, way, way back when the mansion was new, it had had stables to keep horses used to go about town in. This worked out quite well till the advent of the automobile. Pam went flying down the street, holding on for dear life. The sleigh was traveling so fast the snow was being whipped up like a tornado. There was little chance of controlling this rocket on skis. Pam just hoped she could stay on, fearing what might happen if she were to dis become dislodged and wound up stranded in this frosty desert. This is one of the dumbest things I've ever tried, she yelled at the top of her lungs. No one was there to hear her mournful cry. Lieutenant Brambleberry had found a set of skis in the storage shed. He then got a wicker basket, a very large wicker basket, and used some nails that secured the basket to the skis. Or did he secure the skis to the basket? Anyway, he dug out a harness set from way in the back and attached this to the front of the skis. He discovered their horses were no longer there, long, long gone. There hadn't been any horses in the shed in about twenty, about 90 years. As he was trying to find something to take the place of the equine mobility, the yard goat stuck its head in the door and yelled, Hey! The goat wasn't too pleased at being hooked to the sled, but his hooves should work well in the ice and snow, and besides, this was their only choice, which is a misnomer. If you have a choice, you have more than one thing to choose from. Pam felt the cold slipping in through her coat. As she was dressed up with everything she could get on over her head, she had even pulled out her used laundry and put that on as well. The coat covered both her jackets, giving her a girth reminiscent of a small sumo. Her toes had stopped communicating with the rest of her, and her gloves would have slipped off the sides of the basket if not for having become frozen to the edges. She had on an old pilot's helmet pulled on over her hair. It was leather, old and cracked, but it kept her eyes from falling out, and the goggles kept her from becoming ice cubes. It was not as warm as it sounded. Her scarf was wrapped around her face, giving what little protection it could. Pam had taken the precaution of showing a map to the goat just before they set out on this life-or-death, but mostly death adventure. The goat seemed to understand, and he had started out heading in the roughly the right direction. Now Pam didn't have even the slightest inkling of their location. All was white. The goat could barely see in the driving sleep. Ice was forming all along his hair, covering his body. He was looking more like a snow goat than a goat goat. It would have been a good idea to just take a straight course to their destination, but where's the fun in that? He would dash from one side of the lane to the next. With each turn, the sleigh would come up on one ski, and the goat was having as much fun as Pam wasn't. There was a faint glow ahead. It grew in size, but not intensity. Pam watched as it whisked by, giving zero illumination to their trek. Pam wished she had taken a different position in the basket. Snow was being flung up by the goat's hooves. It would fly back and hit the basket. Some would drop down inside and make her sit her down or slowly turning to a frosty bottom. Ice built up on her goggles. Soon the view became psychedelic. Everything had a rainbow effect. 
Lights were coming in several colors, none of which were white. She felt as if she would be sick if not for having skipped breakfast and lunch and dinner. Hey, this is kind of fun. Speak for yourself. A sled of death is not fun. I have to go to the bathroom. Are we there yet? My Pam was wondering where the voices had been. The sleigh seemed to be going at less than let's all die speed and more of this isn't too bad speed. And Pam couldn't see anything beyond her outstretched arm, which she couldn't get loose from the basket. The ground, which is nothing but snow, was passing by slow enough that Pam could actually focus on things coming at her in the dark. There was a parked car, or a mound of snow in the shape of a car. Then a light pole, only visible as a dark shape with a light at the top. The light was only a few feet above the ground. On either side of them, Pam could see what must have been buildings, all dark and quiet. Pam didn't remember this many hills anywhere around town. Can we say snowdrift? We're hopelessly lost. These are all one-story buildings, and the area we need are all two-story buildings. As she wished to convey this to the goat, but the wind tore her words away and tumbled them into the blizzard behind them. The sleigh was definitely moving slower. Pam was now able to focus on the tops of the buildings. There were windows, all with flat roofs above. The roofs were covered in snow, which some had given up their struggle and caved in. Uh, Pam could see snow behind the windows of some of the places. The goat came to a halt. It turned its head and looked at Pam. It looked as if he were smiling. They had somehow left the raging wind behind. Uh, thanks for not killing us. Pam tried to get up from the basket, and as she partway froze to the sled. The wind had stopped blowing, and this was odd because it was howling like a banshee just a few blocks away. Here, all was surrounded by fog. It was thick haze that felt colder than the wind-driven flakes from before. The air burned Pam's lungs as she tried to breathe. Her nostrils had frozen shut, making it necessary to breathe through her mouth. This made her throat dry and itchy. There wasn't a sound entering her ears. Pam got her gloves unstuck from the basket, and then she tried to break free from Ricey's seat by pushing with her arms as she twisted back and forth. I hope I don't tear my pants doing this. She got her body up over the side of the basket, and then with a splintering sound, she came loose and fell into the snow at her side. She reached back and tried to feel to be sure her pants had survived the escape, but her fingers were too cold to feel anything, and her backside was too cold to feel her fingers anything of importance. We need to get in out of this cold, she, started, she stated the obvious, because she couldn't think of anything original to say. Uh, grabbing the huge sack from the back of the sleigh, she looked for shelter among the desolation. The crunch of snow underfoot was a new sensation. Uh, Pam had been in snow before, but the snow was all of a few inches, and the cold had been somewhere around freezing, not below. And she pulled herself along, trying to stay on top of the snow, but her feet would sink with each step. The goat tagged along behind her. It took everything Pam had to get as far as the windows of one of the buildings. She looked in through the windows, and there was furniture in some, others just snowy tombs. Pam saw what looked like the top of a sign at her feet. Kneeling down, she could just make out the tops of letters. A capital A was followed by an N, and then a T. This is it. It's the antique shop. We're above the front door, Pam told the goat. The goat looked at her, and then it smiled again. He'd gotten them to their destination. How do we get inside? The snow must be ten feet deep, and it's getting hard just a few feet down. Pam tried to dig using her hands, and it only took a few minutes to realize the futility of her efforts. The goat walked over to one of the broken windows and jumped over the sill, and then turned to Pam and said, Hey! Pam looked at the goat, now on the inside of the building, that she needed to be inside of. Show off. I would have thought of that eventually. Well, maybe, maybe not. 
Pam stepped over the sill and into the building. If anything, the air here was colder than the air outside. Her breath left a white cloud in front of her face. The scarf was a solid mass of crystal. The goat was making steamy clouds as well, but the cold wasn't hitting him as hard. He was covered from head to foot, well, head to tail, with ice, but it was working to keep the heat in as well as the cold out. Let's see if we can get downstairs. That's where the store should be. Pam led the goat over to the door. The door was locked, of course. Pam tried to turn the knob, but to no avail. She was about to try hitting the door with a table leg when she noticed the lock had a knob on this side of the door. Turning it with her feelingless fingers, she got the door open enough to slip through into the darkness on the other side. The building was making an ominous creaking sound, like what Pam imagined a wooden ship would sound like just before it was crushed by an iceberg. Feeling the wall, Pam headed for what she hoped was the stairs going down. The stair was there, and she found it when her foot fell out from underneath her. She would have tumbled to the bottom if not for catching her sleeve on the handrail. Now let's go see if the cursed container is here. If it wasn't Pam, if it wasn't, Pam did not have a plan B. Her boots made a clumping sound as she descended into the dark. I should have brought a flashlight, she thought about the time she was trapped in the old outhouse. The light hadn't really helped it all that much. Once they got to the bottom, Pam had to feel along in the dark, trying to find the back door to the antique shop. There seemed to be a sliver of light coming through the bottom of a door. Could someone be here, waiting for rescue? Was Pam about to encounter someone trapped here by the ice? She got a hold of the doorknob and turned. As the door swung inwards, the light came streaming into her dazed eyeballs. After the darkness, this was almost a welcome change. The entire shop was lit by an eerie glow. Like nothing Pam had ever seen before, it was almost bright enough to read by. Pam walked into the shop looking for the source of this unnatural illumination. It was coming from a case set on the counter, pouring out from the leather case like molasses on a cold morning. It filled the air with cold inadequacy. The temperature had dropped even farther. The fog diffused the light, making everything look as if it were underwater. The light only caused the shadows to be much darker. Pam was about to slam the case shut, but then she remembered there was a spell or something she needed to do. I hope I brought those instructions. She tried to pull her gloved hand into her pocket. When this didn't work, she tried to pull the glove off, but her other hand refused to get in on her attempt at removing said glove. Pam brought the glove up to her mouth, intent on using her teeth to grasp the glove. The scarf was in the way. Well, some of the scarf was now in her mouth. Frustration led to her clomping down with her teeth and managing to get the glove hold held between her teeth and the scarf. She pulled her hand free. The glove stayed attached to the scarf, which was tucked to her face. Her hands shook as she rummaged in her pocket for the page she had ripped from the notebook. It came up, folded up into a small square. Drats, she fumbled with her frigid fingers, trying to unfold the uncooperative sheet. She tried blowing on her digits, but the scarf interfered with that prospect. I need a vacation, like yesterday. Pam fumbled around in the sack slung over one shoulder like Santa on a bad day trip. The sack wound up spilling its contents across the floor, but now they were accessible. Pam scooped up the candles and got out her lighter. Have you ever tried to fire up a lighter with a frozen finger? It wouldn't recommend it. It's, it's hard to do. It would make your head hurt. A Pam had to hold the lighter with one hand while trying to spin the tiny spark wheel with the other. After dropping the cursed thing several times, Pam managed to get the first candle lit. This gave her a source of heat, if a tiny little itty-bitty source of that. Enough to warm a mouse, maybe. 
or enough to warm a finger or two so you can use them to light a few more candles. The candles came in a variety of color. Instructions said light several candles but it failed to say which color. So a Pam had grabbed as many and as many colors as she could find in the bag office. Fortunately, several of the staff had occupations that called for lots of candlelight. Soon, Pam had the entire counter awash in burning wax. This gave her enough light to see Mr. Bandelarium standing against the wall behind the counter. I'm sorry I didn't think anyone was here. She felt like she'd been caught doing something bad. Mr. Bandelarium just stood there, not moving. The look on his face was one of fear and impending doom. He was as solid as a chunk of ice found in the Antarctic. The sound of something moving through the shop made its way through the leather pilot's cap and entered Pam's ears. It wasn't walking or shuffling. It sounded dangerous and disgusting. Shelves chose to fall apart rather than allow the thing to touch them. The fog parted, allowing it to move closer to Pam. There it stood, the Arctic spirit. It looked as if a glacier had been crossed with a crocodile. It was hard to be sure because its form kept coalescing as it approached. The only color was cold. Pam thought she was cold before. As the spirit approached, it brought more freezing air with it. Pam held the paper in front of her face, trying to read by the flickering light of hundreds of some candles. Everything was a blur. The ice on her goggles made reading unimaginable. With one shaking hand, Pam pushed the glasses up so she could see. This allowed the cold into her eyes. Oh, now that hurts. Life just keeps getting more interesting. Pam remembered why she was here. Be gone, you foul creature. Your days have come to an end. The creature began to laugh. You wimpy little girl, you think you can order me around? It sounded, it said all of this without stopping with its laughter. I command you to enter your prison cell. She tried to put the authority she lacked into her voice. The spirit approached the leather-bound case and looked inside. It only smiled, showing more teeth. I will make your death far more painful even than anything you can imagine. Pam took a step towards the far corner of the shop. You are powerless against me. Oh, but if it were only true, she was sure the shaking was caused by the cold. The spirit turned in her direction. I think I will start by devouring your toes. It took one step in her direction. Pam brought the canister wand up from her side where it had been concealed. Her fingers couldn't feel the trigger, but somehow she managed to trigger it. A spray of liquid shot out and hit the fog in front of the spirit. The Arctic spirit just threw its head back and let rip with a laugh. This made the building shake and icicles fall from the ceiling. Abruptly, its mirth was brought to an end. Pain something the spirit was unfamiliar with, shot through its body. Pam loosed another stream of liquid, hammering the fog all around the thing. The Arctic spirit shook with rage as something unimaginable coursed through its body. It retreated to escape the wicked spray. Pam began showering the ceiling as well as both sides of the spirit, driving it back as her feet refused to advance. When the spray couldn't reach the spirit anymore, Pam found it was either move in close or risk losing her slight advantage. Uh, just as victory was leaning in Pam's direction, the stream began to grow weak. Pam shuffled her shoulder, trying to get the canister from her back. The tank slid from her arm and Pam immediately grabbed the handle and pumped the sprayer up some more. The Arctic spirit, sensing the change in activity, began to advance on his adversary. The stream was now back in full force, and Pam blasted the thing in front of her with the stream. The Arctic spirit leapt backwards and landed in the open case. Pam continued her assault with the liquid. As the Arctic spirit began to lower itself into the case, it let out with a mournful voice. 
What, it whispered, what is in that thing? Pam slammed the lid on the case, and she then clomb up on top so the case was held shut by her not-so-substantial weight. Antifreeze, you nasty beast. What better to use against a freezing monster? The angry light was gone. Now only a few candles remained lit, the ones Pam hadn't blasted with the liquid. Pam surveyed the shop around her. Every surface was covered with shimmering ice. The tiny drops fell from the ceiling. The fog was more intense than before. The goat looked more wet than icy. Pam felt the snot icicle release from the end of her nose, and the air no longer breathed, no longer froze her throat. To say it was warm was not true. It just was no longer below zero. Pam managed to get the leather strap back through the brass buckles and secured the case. This is going to some place nobody can ever open it again. The goat smiled at this idea. Ice cold water began to flow across the floor. Pam's moon boots were kind of waterproof, so she waded across the floor, managing to exit by the front door. The door swung inwards giving way to a wall of partially melted snow. This is going to take a while. The goat said, hey. Do you think my folks are okay? Pam looked at the goat for answers. Hey? The goat looked back with those weird goat eyes. Then it shook water from his fur. Pam was treated to a freezing cold wet shower. Let's go, I can't wait. Pam tried to climb the slippery incline just outside the door. The wet, icy surface gave nothing to grasp. Uh, Pam was reduced to slashing, splashing in the water with her gloves. Seeing her predicament, the goat watched himself up the ice wall, as if doing this sort of thing was normal. His pointy hooves gave him an advantage Pam could only admire. Once... Once he was outside, the goat grabbed the harness he'd used to pull the sleigh and drug the whole contraption over to the shop. Dropping the harness, it fell down to Pam. Such a gentleman. Pam hauled herself up in the leather case to the top of the slope just outside of the shop. I need to be over that way a few blocks, Pam hooked the goat back to the sleigh. You don't have to kill us getting there, but the sooner the better. They pulled up out front her home. It looked as if the contractors who it looked as if the contractors would be quite happy to submit a bid on fixing what was left. There were no lights visible from any windows. Pam pulled her aching, weary, pain racked body from the basket and stumbled to the front door. The feeling had returned to her toes. This did not help. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Pam had to grit her teeth and try not to yell. The goat was unhooking itself and followed. She got to the front door and pressed the doorbell. Well, it didn't make its usual ding-dong sound, so Pam tried hammering on the door. Anybody home? Are you still alive? Am I an orphan now? The door swung open, and there stood her dad, his pistol held at the side of his leg. He'd been expecting someone far worse. The homecoming was anything but dignified, and Pam didn't think she'd stop crying before sunup. Chapter 13, After All Pam should have taken the next day off, but she felt weird sleeping on the floor in her kitchen. The goat didn't seem to mind as long as he had access to the garbage can. The Bellums had offered to relinquish her bedroom, but Pam insisted they stay until other arrangements could be made. Uh, Paula had done and said all the things mothers say and do when they think their youngest and oldest, as well as their only daughter, just might have been taken away by this mid-July snowstorm, only to find said daughter were still alive and standing in the doorway. Questions were asked and answers were given, some of which might have been just a bit glossed over quite a lot. Pam didn't want her mother to worry unduly. What mother wanted to hear about her daughter being drugged through a frozen wasteland to have a close encounter with an arctic spirit? 
Pam's car was still stuck in the partially thawed ice, so her father had done something he never ever would do for anyone. He had loaned Pam his truck. Somehow he knew what his kid had done. The goat was mad at having to ride in the bed of the pickup, but her father insisted. Even if the goat had saved the entire city. Pam sat at the coffee bar and had a long conversation with Wanda. It was a one-sided conversation. So, what do you think? Should I take a week off and spend it at home, or should I wait and take off later this month? Wanda sat there, her chin propped up on one hand, and the other was hovering near her cold, dusty cup of moldy coffee. It was time for a fresh cup. Cassandra said from the doorway, You should take the next few weeks and go see something other than this place, she had overheard Pam's question. Most of the city had thought out. Only the central part of town was still trying to get back to July weather. As the temperature had gone up, the snow had begun to melt, and there was fog shrouding most of the town. The business strip near her home was a total loss. Pam pulled the notebook page from her pocket, intent on saving it as a souvenir of the Arctic, Arctic spirit case. She gently spread the sheet out on the counter. Looking at the smudged and wrinkled page, her eyes settled on one word. Otto Frisch. Otto Frisch? What the heck is Otto Frisch? Pam racked, racked her brain. It says use Otto Frisch to bleed off the spirit's energy. She had misread the instructions. Cassandra looked at Pam's expression. You look as if you've seen Mr. Armstrong in a Speedo. As saying, as saying you look as if you've seen a ghost was just no longer done. Pam thought about it. It looks as if I got lucky last night. Otto Frisch, antifreeze, who knew? Do you know where I can get a few books by Terry Pratchett? Which ones do you need? He wrote 71 books. Uh-oh. Pam was glad she had a healthy bank account for once in her life. The, ca the staff came trickling in. They had put extra effort to get in since this was Friday, and they wanted to pick up their paychecks. Barbara was looking in her coffee cup as if to say, This stuff is crap. When Eddie came back to work, oh, when is Eddie coming back to work? But she didn't. When will Eddie be back? I was going to cash my check. She looked at the cup of less than gifted brew. Pam thought she might be able to handle things till Eddie got back. I'll get it for you. She looked at the back side of the coffee bar. Anyone know which one of these drawers holds the cash? The back of the bar had what looked to be about a hundred drawers, all the same size and shape, and all of them unlabeled. The bar was left over from a time when anything and everything was made by hand with skill and care. Whoever cared enough to craft this monster fixture didn't care enough to insert label holders. Madam Dingus held one hand out towards the bar, and the other touched her forehead. She closed her eyes and said... It's the third from the top on the left-hand side. Pam pulled the drawer open, only to find a drawer filled with spoons. Try the bottom drawer, fifth row from your right, Manuel pitched in. Pam counted over and then down, only to find a drawer full of rubber bands. Soon, most of the gang were standing behind the counter, pulling out drawers, more out of curiosity than a search for the elusive cash drawer. I got it, Hilda said from the floor. She was down there anyway, so she pulled out the first handle she came to. It's nothing but ones. She held up a handful of one-dollar bills. Well, here are the tens. Carol had been opening drawers and stumbling on piles of cash. As drawers were pulled and money was found, it soon became apparent the cash drawers had been arranged by the same person who had done the filing. It's too bad Susie is unavailable. You could get her to rearrange this mess. Carol got her busy cashing checks. It, looked, it took some time to find the drawer that held the old used checks. Hildy's head appeared above the countertop. My sister said she'll take the job. She pulled herself up to a standing position. She was on the wrong side but didn't want to risk moving till she had consumed a sufficient amount of caffeine. 
Tell her to come by Monday at 9. Hopefully I'll be here to show her the ropes. Pam hoped her next new hire would work out better than the last one. Believe it or not, the character of Mrs. Hatchett, Bonnie Fulbright, Susie Quartz, and Dorothy are all based on a woman I knew back when I rode a fire truck for a living. As she was interesting to watch as she moved from personality to personality. A friend of mine thought it would be a good idea to date her. He said it would be like going out with a dozen women. Boy, was he sorry. About that gas station from the Twilight Zone, a friend of mine named Dave and I were bringing a load of medical supplies back from El Paso to Laredo. We needed gas and spotted a gas station sign off of I-10, and it was exactly like the one in the story. Eh, mostly. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the uh, bag company. Here we go again. If you did, I will be back someday soon with the next exciting adventure of Pam Bogus and the Bag Company. The next one is called The Bag Company Go Squatching. Until next time, this is Chris James for Storytime. Are you, are you coming to the tree? With a strong upper man, the same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be. If we met at midnight in the hanging tree.